Welcome to European Journeys. This is the seventh stage of a series that takes us in the city of Geneva and where in particular we look at how God made Geneva before the Reformation. And today the Temple de Saint-Gervais will be our destination. It is located in the suburb which bears the same name, Grotte Saint-Gervais, near the small square called Place Isaac Mercier. And this is on the northern side of the River Rhône, only 400 meters away from Lille, the island, which we visited in our last two previous stages. Well, even though this church used to be outside the city's walls, it is in fact one of the oldest sites of Christian worship in Geneva. Moreover, archaeological research have revealed that there was here probably a Roman villa before the Christian era. And the current church, however, is the fruit of a restoration undertaken in the early 20th century, and its architecture reflects the original Romanesque style of a previous church, which probably was built in the 10th century. But the roots of this temple, the Temple de Saint-Gervais, are even more ancient. The first Christian edifice built here was a crypt, and this crypt is still visible in the basement. And it dates back to at least the 4th century, and some estimates even go as far back as the year 122. So if this were to be the case, this would be one of the oldest Christian sites of Switzerland, still standing today. So as we can imagine, the church has a lot to tell about the Christian roots of Geneva. And as we will see, not only it has a lot to tell about Geneva, but also a lot about Europe. In particular, the Temple de Saint-Gervais will unveil to us two very different views of who has authority over the world that have competed against one another all throughout history, even to this day. So let us start with the name of the church. The Temple de Saint-Gervais of Geneva is one among many church edifices bearing the same name, in particular in France. So who was Gervais? Well, most of the information we know about him, whose name in Latin was Gervasius, comes from a letter to the bishops of Italy falsely ascribed to the bishop of Milan, Ambrose. Gervasius and his twin brother Protasius were martyrs of the early church in Italy. The accounts about the time they lived and the circumstances of their death are uncertain. Some sources say that the twins and their parents Vitalis and Valeria died during Nero's persecutions in the 60s AD, but others placed their death during the persecution under Antoninus in the 2nd century or even Diocletian in the early 4th century. Well, according to the letter, supposedly written during the persecutions under Empress Justina in the 4th century, the Bishop of Milan was warned that the corpses of Gervasius and Protasius were located in the roof of the basilica of the city. The corpses were thus found at the exact place in an amazing state of conservation, according to the letter. Then, the letter says that one day, a plank fell from the roof and cut their heads, which caused blood to flow out. The bleeding, still according to the letter, would have continued for a very long time, and the corpses were transported in numerous places, provoking a sense of wonder among the people. The bodies were also brought to Geneva, and this is probably why the church bears the name Saint-Gervais. Well, of course, such accounts reveal an obvious mixture of Christian faith and pagan beliefs, which was widespread in the era preceding the Reformation in Europe. And this can render the task of knowing what is true from what is forced in those times particularly difficult. However, the martyrdoms of Gervasius and Protasius remain highly probable. But why would these people be persecuted? Well, in fact, early Christians were persecuted mainly because they claimed that the ultimate authority belonged to Christ and not to the emperor. So the name of the temple, Saint Gervais, reminds us that in this early era, Christianity spread in spite of frequent persecutions that the church had to face. And the crypt of the temple might be one of the best testimonies of such growth to be found here in Geneva. 
because some accounts inform us that a prominent Genevan pagan priest of the god Apollo, who was named Franz, converted to Christianity right on this site during this same era. Well, from these early centuries of Christianity, we will now do a huge leap to the 15th century as we now look to the chapel located under the bell tower of the temple. This chapel was built in the 1430s by a rich Genevan merchant named Mathieu Bernard d'Espagne. And the mural paintings give us an idea of the flourishing arts of the time. On one painting in particular, we see a man under the protection of the Virgin Mary, which is obviously a sign of these Roman Catholic times. But it may come as a surprise to realize that this man was none other than the Duke of Savoie, Amédée VIII. Knowing the long-standing enmity that existed between Geneva and the Ducal House, this would be indeed a surprise. But even more surprising, the reason that he is depicted here may not be linked to his role as a duke, but rather to his role as a pope. Yes, this obviously deserves some explanation. Well, in the 15th century, the Roman Catholic Church faced serious internal threats of divisions, in particular after a church council was organized in Basel. When Pope Eugene IV unilaterally decided to move the council to Italy, the majority of the participants refused, and some of them, seeking to depose him, appointed a new pope. And so in 1439, Amede was consecrated as Pope Felix V. Well, his papacy lasted a decade until the struggle with Rome was finally resolved. Well, the papacy, believed to be the highest representative office of God on earth, represents a top-down rule of the world. And had Felix's papacy been consolidated, the Duchy of Savoie could have become a new empire in which both temporal and ecclesiastical rules would have been held by the ruling house of Savoie. The word of the Duke would have been the word of the Pope, and therefore the word of God. And even though Felix, alias Amede VIII, was reputedly a godly man, there was no guarantee at all that all subsequent rulers would have been so. Well, in such a context, we can easily imagine that Geneva would have not been able to resist its incorporation into the Duchy of Savoie for a very long time. However, through God's providence, history took another course. Less than a century later, Geneva adopted the Reformation and accepted that the Word of God should be the ultimate authority over the city instead of any human ruler or any human institution including the church. And in this, the reformers stood for the exact same cause that had provoked the death of Gervais in the early centuries of Christianity. Thus, the Temple de Saint-Gervais shows us two opposed views of authorities. On the one hand, the Pope, whose word he thought to be the authoritative word of God or the only rightful interpreter of the word of God, and on the other, the word of God, which is meant to be authoritative over all human institutions, including the Pope. And we can easily understand here that the first view leads only to human tyranny, while the other leads to freedom under God. I'm Cedric Placentino. See you next week for another stage of European Journeys. <laughs>